All right. Well, I appreciate you all bearing with me. I think it's bad luck to have a math talk without any technical difficulties with the PowerPoint. So I think this is a good sign going forward. So today I'm going to wrap up my discussion of rank structured numerical linear algebra. Uh, we're going to talk about how to, uh, how to create really fast eigensolvers for HSS matrices, which we've been talking about the past two weeks. So to start off, I'm going to very, very briefly, just a slide or two, review what HSS structures are, and in particular highlight the feature or two that we're really going to have to use again and again and again in these eigensolvers. Then I'll take a few slides and I'll talk about some of the more common standard eigenvalue solvers uh, used for general purpose sparse or dense matrices. I'll build these up in kind of a historical sense to give an idea of how the progression um, has gone, you know, ending with HSS eigenvalues. I'll talk about why these standard eigenvalue solvers, by this I mean things like uh, Wilkinson's uh, shifted QR, things like uh, Rayleigh iterations, have a lot of strengths. but. Uh, in some situations, they're just not very good in terms of their storage, in terms of how fast they are. And I'll talk about how HSS eigensolvers really combat a lot of these issues and work really well for structured matrices. So the four HSS eigensolvers we'll talk about today uh, you know, really depend on what kind of symmetry your matrix has and how many eigenvalues you want and if you want just the eigenvalues, the eigenvalues, or eigenvectors. But the good news is we have a full arsenal. So depending on the kind of problem you're looking at, you might either want to do some sort of bisection scheme, some sort of divide and conquer scheme, uh, an alteration of FEAST, uh, Eric Polizzi's algorithm, uh, which uses contour integration, and or an SVD. So we'll talk about all those, when we use them, and how we use them. OK, so to review HSS matrices, uh, and we've seen this twice already, but the main idea, again, is that we have these off-diagonal blocks and these off-diagonal HSS block rows all have a low rank, which allows us to write everything you know, in terms of this nested, low rank, hierarchical basis, which we do all using a binary tree, which we've talked a lot about. These are some of the, issue, uh, some of the features I'd like to draw your attention to, for, particularly for today. These come up a lot in the eigensolvers. Uh, it's very parallelizable, and all the eigensolvers I'm going to share with you today are fully parallelizable. Not, we haven't necessarily implemented it, but they're all, there's nothing stopping us in theory. ON storage, which especially when you want to talk about eigenvectors, is a huge thing uh, because there are not a lot of eigensolvers out there to give you full eigen decomposition that can do it in ON storage, where this can give you ON storage. Um, we can write the matrix in terms of, entirely in terms of block diagonal plus rank one updates. And in terms of the eigen problem, there is a tons and tons of papers out there, a lot of results on the theory of a rank one update to a matrix. So we're going to utilize that again and again and again. And then of course we have things like mathbex and inversion which we can do quite fast. So this is what we're going to utilize. Um, so again, uh, here's the definition of an HSS matrix uh, formally, which I've already gone over a few times. We have these cell arrays, these, these generators, where the Ds correspond to what's on the diagonal, the U's and the V's refer to the row and the column bases, and the other matrices, the R's, the W's, and the B's, tell us as we go up, across, and down the tree, respectively, the interactions between the rows and column bases at different levels. OK, so now we're going to talk about some of the basic eigensolvers um, that you're probably familiar with. To start off, I'm going to review the concept of a Rayleigh quotient. In a lot of more primitive eigensolvers, we first have an eigenvector, and from that we want to extract an eigenvalue. And it's you know, a very uh, straightforward mathematical concept how to get that. In, in particular, one of the earliest methods, uh, I, I think it's a very you know, instructive kind of first idea of how to extract eigenvectors is the power method, where basically all you do is if you apply your matrix A over and over again to you know, a randomly drawn vector, uh, you will get the, in a lot of cases, get the largest eigenvector. Um, so you know, it's a very simple method, uh, and, it's, and it's very cheap because you're just doing matrix vector products, which for a lot of matrices is, are very cheap. Um, this has a lot of issues. Uh, first and foremost, you can't prove anything about its convergence at all. Um, and you know, in, you know, even given as fast as it's only O n squared, and yeah, so. But you know, this is what the whole algorithm looks like, and we show that you know you can use this to get all the eigenvalues, all the eigenvectors values. And you do this with shifts, which is a concept that comes up. The idea of a shift comes up a lot when I get to the bisection scheme, so I wanted to introduce it here. And that is instead of doing this power iteration over and over again in our matrix A, 
we do it on this augmented matrix A minus mu times the identity, where mu is kind of an approximation we can get in a lot of different ways of our eigenvalues, kind of where we know the eigenspace is. And so we'll use this idea a lot in bisection. We kind of, kind of guess at where the eigenvalues are and then do operations on the shifted matrix to find out exactly where they are. And this is a very old idea. Yes. So this talk you will consider only symmetric matrix or you will consider general? In this talk I will consider general matrices. And uh, a few of my algorithms only work for symmetric, a few of them work for all of them, and I will be very careful to specify when something is only good for symmetric and why it's only good for symmetric. So, yeah. Um, so, you know, going to this power method, uh, you know, a better way to do it in terms of stability is you know, using the inverse of this matrix. Yes, Kyle? Did you say mu is an approximate value for uh, an estimate of where an eigenvalue is? Yes. Okay, but then if it were, uh, if it were an estimate for where an eigenvalue is, that would make the matrix non-singular, right? But, so, so we see A minus mu I inverse. So if mu is exactly an eigenvalue, then that expression is non-singular. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, it wouldn't, it, yeah it, wouldn't, so it, wouldn't, it wouldn't work. You're counting on being a little bit wrong with the estimate mu? Am I understanding that correctly? Yes. I, I guess I don't really want to dwell on this algorithm because okay. it's just kind of introductory to, okay. what, to what we're talking about. But no, it's, you're absolutely right with, with your uh, intuition on that. All right. That's good. Um, yeah, so doing inverse iteration, you know, uh, inverse iteration, which is um, what I talked about from the inverse, we do have convergence results. So this is like one of the first methods that came about where we can prove definitively, you know, in some very rigorous asymptotic sense, how fast we're going to get it. And this is something we really, really like, you know. And so all the HSS solvers I'm going to show you today have strict convergence results like this because otherwise, you know, you, you never know. We really want pride ourselves in having what we call a black box eigen solver. We give you, you give us any matrix in a class that we specify and you know that you'll get an accurate solution in a certain amount of steps. Um, so one of, this was one of the earliest, um, I guess, well-accepted eigenvalue algorithms called the uh, Rayleigh iteration, which is basically going back and forth of iterations of the inverse iteration, which uh, what I just showed you, and just doing a Rayleigh quotient. So um, before, uh, before Wilkinson shifted QR came along, this is what most standard linear algebra packages did for a general purpose eigen solver. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about the Francis QR step, uh, which you might know by a number of names. You might know this by as QR iterations or just QR, shifted QR, bolds chasing. Basically, this is what your computer does when you just type in on MATLAB eig. Or, or the very basic, you know, general purpose um, in, in LAPAC. This is, is an old algorithm. It's about 50 years old, but it is still, to this day, one of the fastest algorithms for any type of matrix. Um, its only downsides are it is qubit complexity, which, you know, for larger and larger matrices we have these days is just not feasible. And it has yet to really be effectively paralyzed. And in 2015, communication costs are even more important than you know, the complexity of the operations. So this is really probably not going to be used a lot in the future. But it has really dominated the eigenvalue landscape of the past 50 years. And I think it's very important um, to know how it works. And so like I said, its advantage is it works for any square matrix. doesn't have to be real. doesn't have to be symmetric. doesn't have to have any nice eigenvalue properties. It's very stable. And it's uh, very easy to implement. Uh, the, some of the HSS solvers I'm going to show you in a little bit, I mean, even MATLAB implementations can be well over 1,000 lines where you can implement a good shifted QR in like 50 lines. So, so the main idea is just uh, over and over again, we, so this is the basic algorithm, then I'm gonna introduce the shifts, which is gonna be a common theme today of shifting an algorithm to really help out the performance. But the main idea is just, you know, recursively you do a QR factorization of your matrix at a certain point, and then you recombine the factors in reverse order. So, and then this, you know, historically you can do it in a number of ways. You can do it with Gram-Schmidt, you can do it through Householder. Um, and basically the idea is if you do this for a sufficiently large number of times, you will eventually get a trigonal, uh, not tridiagonal, a uh, triangular matrix so you can basically read off your eigenvalues. 
Now, unfortunately, as I wrote it, it does not converge for all matrices. There's a very famous counterexample that just shows if you just take a 0, 1, 1, 0, a 2 by 2 matrix, uh, it'll just give you the same thing over and over and over again. So the way you combat this is, again, with shifts. And uh, this, this idea was uh, with John Francis, who I love uh, using his picture whenever I give a talk about him. Uh, this shifted QR is easily one of the 10 most important numerical algorithms of the 20th century, but I think it is very fascinating that this, John Francis published two papers in his lifetime. And after, uh, you know, one of them was this. <laughs> and then kind of went off, worked in industry, lived a happy life, but just kind of never really communicated with anyone in academia. And it's just very fascinating to me because it was at a very young age. So. Yeah, but <laughs> in particular, this is, the, this is the Francis shift. This is the shift he chose um, that you can, and the talk is non QR, so I won't go into too detail how this was chosen. But with this, you get a very stable, very fast algorithm if you sh choose these as your shifts of the matrix that you do the QR on. So uh, ultimately, this is what the whole algorithm looks like. And I would like to, I would like to uh, point out the two major steps what you're doing heuristically. And I'll show you a picture just on the next slide. That first, we reduce the matrix to Hessenberg form. Everyone knows what that means? I assume it's, yeah, it's triangular but with the extra. And then from that, you operate on the Hessenberg matrix. Similarly, in the symmetric case, you would reduce this to tridiagonal and then operate on a tridiagonal matrix. Now, Historically, this has been a great way of thinking about eigenvalue problems, but all those transformations are always going to be cubic. And so when we try and design HSS Ivan solvers, we thought really hard, we do not want to do anything like this. We want to operate on the original matrix directly and not have to transform it to something simpler using cubic. Um, okay, so this, this is the Francis QR step. Now. And to give you an idea of what it looks like, why they call, a lot of people refer to this as bulge chasing, when you get this Hessenberg form, you, um, you, know, you do the operations I showed you, and it, one step, one column at a time will get you your triangular matrix. Um, OK, so one more important thing I'd like to bring up before we get to the actual HSS eigensolvers is the idea of what we do if it's symmetric, um, which I told you we make it a tridiagonal instead of Hessenberg. And then we perform in that tridiagonal matrix what's referred to as the divide and conquer algorithm, which was developed by Mingu and Stanley Eisenstadt, who I enjoy pointing out were my grand advisor and my great grand advisor, so I'm really staying in the family business here. <laughs> <laughs> um, who came up with that in the mid 90s? And I will go over, I think, yeah. So I would like to go over, take a few minutes to tell how this uh, divide and conquer works for a tridiagonal matrix because the HSS divide and conquer, although a lot more complicated, is a direct generalization. And this algorithm has been around for 20 years. So I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's in all the standard packages. It's quite good. The tridiagonal? The tridiagonal, the tridiagonal oh, version. Okay, gotcha. Tridiagonal divide and conquer. Yeah. So what the tridiagonal divide and conquer does is it takes a matrix and notices that we can write it as a block diagonal plus just this little, you know, this little postage stamp there, the little block, that very easily can be written as a rank one update, which is great because there are results by Wilkinson and Golub respectively that have shown that for a symmetric, and okay, this is my first point where I'm saying this has to be symmetric. This, this algorithm is only symmetric because uh, we only have guaranteed diagonalizations for symmetric, well, for normal matrices, but in particular symmetric. And this result only holds for symmetric matrices. That in this case, um, the eigenvalues of T, the whole thing, are just the eigenvalues of the diagonal um, plus beta, which is here, you know, the, the value right on the corner, plus ZZT, where ZZT is a concatenation of the eigenvectors of this guy and this guy. So what it means is that to get the eigenvalues and vectors of the whole thing, we only need to get it of here and here and do a little update. And the little update is also something that's been very well, very well studied. OK, but so I'll talk about how we get the update. But does this make sense so far? We show that, yeah, we only need to get of the little matrices. And this process begs us to do recursion on it, that we can do over and over and over again and basically be solving for only the eigen decompositions of very small matrices where doing cubic operation is nothing, and then just building it up and up in terms of updates. So it basically says a tridiagonal matrix is a diagonal matrix plus a bunch of rank one updates. And I argue that an HSS matrix 
through a much more complicated process can be thought of in the exact same sense. So rank one updates, luckily, are something that have been very well studied. Uh, we owe a lot of this work to uh, Gene Golub and to uh, Nielsen and Bunch. Um, we've done a lot of the pioneering work on this. And that to get the eigenvalues of a rank one update, you only have to solve what is called the secular equation. It looks like this. It's just a, it's just a rational equation where your, you have these roots are the eigenvalues of your original matrix and the poles um, you, are, you interlace with the eigenvalues of the updated matrix. And there's lots of great software that's been out for a while, a lot of good algorithms that sh can get you the eigenvalues of this very quickly. Uh, the one in particular I'm going to be talking about today is called, uh, was developed by Ren Kong Lee. Uh, it's called Lee's Middle Way. And it is just this beautiful algorithm. It, you know, it utilizes the fast multiple method. It you know, really uses the poles to guarantee you stability, which seems counterintuitive, but it works very well. And yeah, it gets you all, the, all these zeros in linear time very consistently, which is really good. But again, this only works for the uh, symmetric case. And then once we have these eigenvalues, to get the eigenvectors, just doing a little algebra, we see we only have to solve diagonal systems. Uh, for stability reasons, we don't do it like this in practice. I'll talk about how we do it in practice, but at least heuristically, it's all very simple linear time operations. Okay. So that will conclude my discussion on non-HSS eigensolvers. I just like to point out, you know, a lot of great, you know, not a lot of matrices, not all matrices are HSS, and so we use these a lot. But some of the reasons we don't like them is all the methods I just talked about are either n squared or n cubed time. Uh, they're O n squared storage, which you might think it would be the best we can get because an eigenvector matrix is n squared data, but for and even for a sparse matrix, the, the, you know, unless you have a very, very trivial case, your eigenvectors are going to be dense. But for an HSS matrix, you actually do not have data dense eigenvectors. I will, I'm not, it's actually a pretty complicated proof, but I'll state it now. For an HSS matrix, the eigenvectors are actually a hierarchy of Cauchy like matrices. So it's not, I, I can't quite say, they're not quite HSS. It's not that simple. But they're just a little bit more complicated than HSS. Which, and the big thing is an HSS eigenvector is linear data. So for applications where we want to keep both the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors, we have this huge advantage of only needing linear storage for the whole thing. Or for, you know, for almost any other type of non-trivial matrix, you need n squared storage and thus n squared complexity for the whole thing. So you're saying if the info matrix a is HSS. Yes. It's eigenvector matrices. N by N eigenvector matrices. The whole eigenspace is also. It's it's uh, it's not quite HSS, but it, but it's but also structured. It's also structured, and we know precisely in what sense it's structured. You said the Cauchy matrix, like so, hierarchical. So yeah, it's basically a tree of Cauchy-like matrices. So you, you need to store, it's not quite n, it's four, you know, Cauchy-like matrix can be represented by four vectors, so it's four log n for the levels of the tree. But that's still so much better than n squared. And, and, and we can also apply the matrix vector product in linear time. You never, you can do a lot of stuff with the eigenvector matrices of an HSS matrix and never have to form the whole thing explicitly. So it's really good for parallel computing and for storage. Um, and then also, uh, a lot of these things I talked about you know, depend on these iterative processes that have debatably good convergence properties where while any eigensolver is going to have to have an iterative component, and that's a basic algebra result because a characteristic polynomial of degree 5 or more is, you know, is not going to be able to be represented um, in the, the number system, but they use iterative processes that don't have the best convergence results where the only iterative process I'm going to use in the eigensolvers I'm going to talk about is this very well studied root finding that we know exactly how fast it's going to converge, exactly how accurately it's going to converge. So we can never escape iterative processes in eigenvalue problems, just by definition almost. But I'll show that for in the HSS case, we can really control how much these iterative processes hurt us, where you can't do that in the more general eigenvalue setting. So these are really, when we design HSS eigensolvers, it's a really big selling point is we're able to deal with these three issues, which really permeate a lot of what, why people are scared away from eigensolvers um, in a lot of cases.
uh, I actually understand if you say those kind of elements, no matter it's direct or iterative for uh, eigensolvers, they depend on suspect convergence results. But uh, HSS, you have very clear categorization of whether it converges or not, or it is always converge, always... Uh, for, for, for the symmetric case, it's very clear to us it always converges. It's uh, always converges for, for symmetric. Yeah, for the, for the non-symmetric case, we have yet to prove that. We've, we've had pretty good results numerically, but I can't say that for certain, for the non-symmetric case. Because so you said any, you know, mathematically, any finding eigenvalues, any solver, just if I just care eigenvalues so like a root finding, and mm -hmm. uh, it's no guarantee the root finding the nominal equation will converge, right? Exactly. So, but for HSS, you say for symmetric case, you can guarantee. It. Because in the HSS case, we're only doing direct calculations and this root finding procedure that's very well defined. And I know exactly how many steps I'm going to need. Um, it is iterative. There is obviously an iterative component, but yes, for the symmetric HSS case, I can guarantee you convergence. Right. I, I, I think I don't understand why for HSS, the okay. finding for symmetric case will be always guaranteed to converge. That, that's not something. Okay, yeah, we, we can talk about that later. Um, okay, so yeah, so I'll move on to you know, why the HSS, I'll move on to the HSS solvers, just very briefly talking about what I really like. I think these HSS solvers, Here's my continuum of eigenvalues, so eigensolvers. And you have very general and very specific. And you know, the, the more specific and trivial matrices, the faster, you know, for a diagonal matrix, you can read off the eigensolver. And I think this game we're always playing is how big of a class of matrices can we make where we still have linear time and then we still have very accurate. And I really think for eigensolvers, HSS is the best we can do um, to get linear time. And you know, you know, you know for uh, for linear systems, there's really, really, really good sparse packages out there. But for eigensolvers, because of you have to, if you want to form the eigenvectors, the best you can do for sparse is n squared. Whereas really, for HSS, this big selling point is even with the eigenvectors, you're n log squared n for the complexity of the whole algorithm. So that's just, you know, I think really uh, one of the big upsides of these algorithms. Okay, so let's move on to the algorithms. Uh, the four I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'll mostly talk about these two. Uh, the first, it depends what do we want. Do we know our matrix symmetric? How much things do we want? So let's say in the first two cases our matrix is symmetric. And let's say we only want a small fraction of the eigenvalues and we don't need any of the eigenvectors. This happens in a lot of applications. Then there's this really, really good algorithm. Uh, my advisor and a, one of his former grad students, uh, Jan Drutzi, uh, that was his uh, PhD thesis here was this algorithm called HSS bisection I'm going to go through. Which, uh, it's a basic bisection scheme, but it utilizes a lot of HSS operations, and in particular the idea of fast inertia evaluation. So that's a really great algorithm. That's just from a few years ago. Um, let's say we have a symmetric matrix, but we do want all the eigenvalues and all the eigenvectors, which is the case in a lot of applications. And this is a project I was, I've been working on for the past, I just wrapped up, I've been working on for about a year. This is using HSS divide and conquer. And you know, this uh, is a whole, there's a lot of bag of tricks you need to make this work and make it work in linear time. I listed just a few of them, you know, from the root finding to the multiple expansion to a lot of nice rank one results. Um, and you have to, you know, do a lot of tricks with the HSS operations to make sure everything stays linear time. But at the end of the day, it, it, it is, the heart of it is just the same idea as the tridiagonal case. You're treating an HSS matrix as a diagonal matrix with a bunch of rank one updates. Um, so I'll talk, you know, in a good detail how this, the basic idea how this works. Um, if you have a non-symmetric matrix, it gets a little tricky. Um, something that we've been working on, that shouldn't say 2015, that should say like in progress. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've been actually working on with Shen and Professor Zha, is that if we have a non-symmetric case, something very promising we've been looking at is that we can get a small subset of the eigenvalues you know, in linear time, kind of altering what's known as the feast algorithm, which is an algorithm that uses contour integration to get um, the eigenvalues for non-symmetric matrices. So we're really excited about continuing work on this. I probably won't say too much about this today, but this is, I think, is the future. Um, if we want all the eigenvectors and all the eigenvalues, this is something I've been looking at for a long time. I don't know if it's possible in ON. Because, uh, you know, when you're dealing in the whole complex plane, to resolve each and every one of those coordinates is just, 
There's a lot of calculations that must be done. So for now, we're going to say no. It's either not possible, we haven't been able to get it yet, but I can get you an SVD. If you just care about the singular values, you know, the spectrum, and not necessarily where exactly the real and imaginary parts of the diagonal value are, I can get you a singular value decomposition, both the singular vectors and singular values in linear time. And that's something my advisor and I just wrapped up. Um, and so that's something I'll talk about very briefly. But it's actually a pretty simple generalization of this algorithm. So if you understand this one, you kind of get, in that sense, symmetric and non-symmetric case. So this is what, at, at this point in time, we're able to do. So do you, for the SVD, do you use just put the matrix zero A, A transpose zero? Or? No. Um, for stability reasons, we don't do that. But it, it, it's, it's similar. It's similar. We kind of, it, it, we implicitly form that. We basically operate on each of the individual blocks and yeah, each and each of the blocks. You do not form it explicitly, but you mean ideally, in, in conceptually, you operate. Conceptually, that's what we're doing. Conceptually, we're uh, finding. Conceptually, it's each time you only operate on A or it's transpose, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so that is exa You're right. No, you're right. That is conceptually what we're doing. I, I just like to point out that the HSS structure allows us to do that at a much finer level, which kind of controls a little bit of stability. But conceptually, that's exactly what we're doing. Thinking about well, it. It reminds me of, of a question. So. Up to now, we talk about the HSS of A. Suppose I have the HSS of A, mm -hmm. uh, but I want to operate on A transpose. Yes. Oh, I have to go. Yeah, yeah automatically. It'd be very, it'd be very simple. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay. No, good question. Good question. Yeah. Okay. So that's how those those work. And so I'll, I guess, spend the next uh, 25 minutes or so talking about these first few algorithms. So uh, by section. Um, why did I, oh, that's why I included that. Oh, this, this algorithm was actually developed to solve toplets problems, which I think is fun, again, to bring up the idea that a toplets matrix doesn't look HSS. Uh, you know, it is dense, and the off-diagonal, if you just calculate rank of an off-diagonal block, it's also dense. But if you do a four uh, FFTs on it, you get this really nice Cauchy-like structure. So I'd just like to point out that a lot of matrices you wouldn't think are HSS have these beautiful hidden HSS structure. Um, but that doesn't really have to do with the eigensolver. The eigensolver is all about inertia. So this is uh, something that I hope was covered whenever all of you took CS515, but it's not always covered. OK, fair enough. So that's the idea that for, um, and again, this is for symmetric A. Uh, the inertia is defined as, you know, so all our eigenvalues are real. We define the triple uh, inertia A, which is just the negative eigenvalues, the zero eigenvalues, and the positive eigenvalues. And this vector is, it, it, you, do a lot of, you can do a lot of operations like similarity transforms or, or other HSS operations, and the inertia is always preserved. That's really the key, and that's the kind of thing we've spent a lot of time in my group proving. So, you know, yeah, and so this idea is a pretty straightforward bisection scheme. You know, you take the real line. And you, and you, if you're only focused on the eigenvalues in a certain region, you focus on that region. And you can basically split it up and you know, move along the line and see how the inertia changes at each point. And I, I, won't, uh, I won't get into it too much today, but we found very fast ways for an HSS matrix to calculate the inertia, basically every time we can do it in linear time where that traditionally would be a more expensive operation. So here, you know, Sylvester's inertia equation, which says if we do for any, it doesn't have to be a, uh, orthogonal, for any symmetrics A uh, uh, and invertible S, the inertia of A is the same as S transpose AS. So what this allows us to do is if we have an LDL factorization of our matrix, um, our inertia A is just the inertia of the diagonal. And so, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, the, the details get a little, little nitty gritty, but the basic idea is we just bisect an interval very quickly and do a lot of fast inertia evaluations with HSS operations you know, using the tree. Um, and we can do for a small, for anything log n or less of the eigenvalues, we can get linear time. More than that, this algorithm is quadratic. But it is very accurate for symmetric matrices. And sorry, I, I, don't, I missed it whether or not you said this. You have a, a, a fast method for going from HSS to LDL? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, and so this just shows the shows the results. Um, this is just a we have better implementations of this now. But this is just from a MATLAB implementation uh, for some small toplets matrices, and the the blue line is just um, is just shifted is just the Francis QR step I talked about. You know, just kind of what MATLAB has built in, 
and we see that even for these very moderately sized matrix, we're already outpacing you know, the, the quadratic, the linear times a lot better than the cubic. So, and as you get bigger and bigger, yeah, this only gets to like 10,000. You get much, much bigger, and then this becomes the, the much preferred method for finding a small subset of eigenvalues of an H, symmetric HSS matrix. Okay, so now I'm to move on to the, uh, if we want all the eigenvalues, with the whole eigen decomposition. Uh, we have to do something a little more fancy than this, but that's okay. So I'd like to go back to the tridiagonal divide and conquer. And let's say that this B, what if it's not just a single column? What if not, you know, because here we have this beautiful sparsity structure, but do we really need it to do everything in terms of these rank one update formulas? And what we found is we don't. If this beta, if it is a rank one update, if it is a vector times another vector, we can still do the same result here. Golub didn't show it just for a single entry. It was for any rank one update. Moreover, if let's say this block is rank two, rank three, rank four, any number much smaller than the size of the block, we can just do the update over and over and over again and at each point update the matrix by you know, rank one. So in the case of an HSS matrix, what this looks like, so here we have just a two by two HSS matrix, in, uh, in particular a uh, symmetric one. And what we do is we rewrite our, this off diagonal block UBV transpose, I've kind of simplified the notation here to, because the tree structure kind of complicates things for the basic idea. And we can write the whole thing in terms of just a sum of rank one updates. And so we still are the same thing. We're seeking a diagonalization of this to get you know, all the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. But we can still do it by first getting the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of matrices that are half as big, and then going back and just performing a bunch of updates. Is, is this clear so far? So that's the main idea, and we do this recursively. We do smaller and smaller and smaller levels. So what we do is we you know, get the agony composition as these very small matrices. They could be one by one if you wanted, but that's not optimal to do that. And then you gradually do, at each node of the tree, you do R rank one updates, where R is the largest you know, HSS rank you have. So this is what the whole algorithm looks like. It's you know, divide and conquer. There are three steps. And I would like to point out a few things about this. We'll, we'll stay here for a minute or two. Um, the first step, the first thing I'd like to point out is that the divide for an HSS is a lot more complicated than for a tridiagonal. For a tridiagonal, all you have to do is subtract a single entry. To modify this, all we had to do to get T1 hat is subtract beta, subtract beta. Where for HSS matrices, you have to do a little more. You have to perform these updates to the B and the D generators in your matrix. Otherwise, you completely lose your HSS form and all the, the, all the operations won't be as accelerated. Uh, you also have to explicitly form these rank one update and recursively store them because, um, you know, unlike, it's not just single entries. Now, it's still linear data, but that is uh, an added cost you don't have in the, in the, tri in the tridiagonal case. Uh, and I'll, and I'll, in the next few slides, I'll kind of show explicitly what this looks like, how we update the B and D generators. Um, the coding's a little complicated, but I think uh, heuristically it's actually pretty simple. Then, just like in the tridiagonal case, we solve for the small eigenvalue problems directly. We can do this with shifted QR, something cubic, doesn't matter, as long as we're very accurate. Then we conquer, we put the pieces together, go from you know, 64 to 32 to 16 all the way down. And we do this with three nested loops. The first one is the levels of the tree from top, um, no, this would be from bottom to top. The second most level is through the nodes at a given level. And the innermost loop is through each of the rank one updates from one to, in practice, not necessarily R, but whatever you have at that node, but at most R. And at each point in this innermost recursion, you have to do four things. Um, the first thing, is just like in the tridiagonal case, you need to apply this vector to, to get z. You do the same thing in the HSS case. So you apply the previous eigenvector matrix 
And we do this implicitly. We never form the rank, the eigenvector matrix in the HSS case. But that's what you're doing. You're applying the previous eigenvector matrix to the rank one update. And that gives you your rank one update vector. Then you solve the secular equation using the root finding I'll talk about in just a minute. And that gives you the eigenvalues of your, of your updated matrix, D plus W, W transpose. Then I said in practice, we don't just solve the diagonal system. For stability reasons and to preserve orthogonality, we, we do what's called solving the inverse eigenvalue problem. We say, I want to find a vector W hat such that exactly to machine, you know, that W, D plus W, W, T has the eigenvalues that I found. Because if, otherwise, if the eigenvalues are kind of close together, if you, you know, assume that you got the right ones, even if you're off just by a little bit, it can throw off the orthogonality of the whole thing. And since we're doing this huge hierarchy of matrices, and you know, we're doing all these multiplications at level, 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 that would just kill the stability of the algorithm. Where this guarantees our orthogonality, and we've shown both in theory and practice, we get the orthogonality to machine precision, which is very important to us. Um, and finally, we have to normalize these pseudo eigenvectors. I mean, there, we don't actually ever have a full eigenvector matrix, but we have to normalize these Cauchy-like vectors um, to, again, preserve stability at later levels. Uh, so how, uh, what's the inverse? So, so you already have the eigenvalues, and you ask well, what should be W. Yeah. You mean this yes. eigenvalue. Saying, uh, uh, but how do you do the search? Mean? How, do you how do you find W hat? Right, right. I mean, what, what's, how do you solve the inverse eigenvalue problem? Uh, this is how you solve the inverse eigenvalue problem. I'll skip ahead since you asked. Um, so you use something called Lohner's formula, and there is, if you want to read more about that, there's a really good treatment of this in uh, Jim Demel's just you know standard textbook, Applied Linear Algebra. Um, so you know this was shown by um, well, Gu and Eisenstadt did a lot of particular stability calculations on this, but this has been around for a while. Um, yeah, so if you just take your, the eigenvalues you solve for and the eigenvalues of the original equation and basically just do, yeah, do this product. Um, I, I won't get into how it's derived, but it's, it's, a, it's a straightforward formula. And something I, you know, I'd like to point out is that even though this is n squared operations, um, because it's you know, just all these products you know, this, with the same kernel over and over and over again, we can get the log of this through the FMM. And so, so what is the tilde lambda i and lambda j? What are the two values? Which is the exact? Which is the so with the tilde, that's the that's the perturbed problem. That's what we solved for. So lambda tilde plus v hat v hat. You have the eigenvalues of this lambda tilde plus the rank. Yes. Right. And you want to. You have the eigenvalue of this one, and you want you have the eigenvalue of lambda tilde, and then you want to look for v hat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so lambda tilde are the eigenvalues of uh, the big lambda. Yes. Tilde. And using those Lohner's using Lohner's formula, formula. give us the uh, yeah uh, the the intended low rank. Yep. Yep. Good. All right. I'll let everyone know when it's 3.20, because at that time, whoever wants, whoever wants to leave, I'll totally understand. I'll probably go to about 3.30. That'll be about what I plan for. Um, so that answers your question? Good. OK, so, um, so yeah, I'm going to, th two things I'd like to focus on really quick in terms of algorithmic details. I won't get into all of them. One is how we solve the secular equation, because it's really at the heart of the algorithm. And the other is what these updates look like. Um, because you know it's kind of just writing that we have to update the B and D generators. I don't think that really means anything. So when we're solving the secular equation, what we really care about is this unconditional stability that it's going to work every time, um, because you know that's what kind of sets us apart from a lot of other iterative algorithms, and that it's linear time and flops and storage complexity. So the the way to do this, the fun, I mean, there's a lot of subtleties to Lee's middle way, but the basic idea is that we transform this secular secular equation by doing a convexity transformation. Because what's been proven about this, um, Melman was the first one to prove this, is that it gives us this convex function, which means we can prove that it, you know, every time it's going to converge right to the value we want. Um, yeah, that's about all I'll say about that. But I mean, that, that's a very important component of our root finding. There's a lot of, you have a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so you, you start with the second equation. Yep. 
And then you're saying you apply a transform so that you will have a convex yes. function, which you want to find. Lo locally convex. Local we, we do it at each different room. Oh, yeah, because you know where it's the interval. Exactly. Right? And that's a key to this. We use, the, we use the poles as kind of kind of gives us exactly where our interval is. And we know it's in between that because the, uh, the rank one update has this really nice interlacing property. Uh, this is only feasible for if the matrix is, has HSSS. Or is for any general. for any symmetric matrix. This for is feasible symmetric. for rank one update to any symmetric matrix. This is this is true. So the rank one update to any symmetric matrix is a very stable problem because of this property. We're just utilizing it. Yeah, you're right. This is that's a good thing to bring up. This is not unique to HSS. This particular thing. Um, yeah. So to show you how the updates work, um, so this is as we're doing divide is a top-down process. The whole matrix go 0 to 2. So I'm going to take a simple example. Let's say we have an HS matrix that's 6 by 6 blocks. Okay? And we take the off diagonals. So here there, uh, I should have had one more slide. I apologize for that. So pretend instead of zeros here, there's just some rank R thing. But we, want, we don't want it to be R. We want it to be 0. We want to get rid of it to make two blocks. So what we do is what we, we take what was in the off-diagonal, our HSS generators, that, you know, for those off-diagonal blocks, and we take all the, at every level, we always update all of the D generators. No matter what level of the tree we're at, we update all the diagonal blocks, and we always update all the B blocks that are lower than whatever level we're at. So through the course of the algorithm, it become, that becomes less and less work. So what that looks like is, for instance, in this case, we would update B1, B3, B4, B8, and all DI. So U1, B1, U2 goes to U1, B1, U2 minus you know, this update times its transpose. And just from simple algebra, you can see that to get that, you have to send B1 to B1 minus this, multiple, this uh, product of our matrices. And we can write this recursion you know, very simply mathematically, and the, the coding works very nicely. That it, you know, We have a general formula that gives us what the updates look like at each level. So what we basically turn this into, uh, it's, it's now 320. So anyone that, that needs to get to the next class or anything, please leave whenever is good for you. Um, so after one level of divide, we have a 2 by 2 block. And we notice that all the Ds have been augmented once. And all of the Bs at the level below it have also been augmented once. So we'll move one level down the matrix. Now we're at the second level. We again, we take these off diagonal blocks, because we want to get rid of them now. We write them. And again, we update the Bs and update the Ds accordingly. And this gives us now three blocks. And we've introduced zeros in all these diagonals. We notice the Ds have been updated twice, and the Bs at the lowest level have also been updated twice. And these updates, you know, are very, we've shown they're stable and they're accurate. And, you know, this is the kind of thing we know we can do with HSS operations. Um, finally, we get the op diagonals at the closest to the diagonal. And we get the whole thing is now just block diagonal. And we do direct eigenique compositions in all these. And then do updates, 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 updates. And we get the eigenique composition of the entire matrix.